Welcome to Carito Connects. I'm your host, Jen, and I've been conversing with friends around the world about life challenges and impactful moments. Conversations on this platform look at answering the questions, how we overcome challenges and how our experiences shape who we are and the work we do today. I hope this work can inspire you on your own personal and individual journey. Let's dive right in. Hello, my guest today is Honduras-born and raised Taiwanese entrepreneur Tiffany Wang, founder of Urgens, a Taiwanese-based com- company combating plastic straws, one reed or grass straw at a time. Having been raised in Honduras, Tiffany shared how her upbringing shaped her childhood, lifestyle, mindset, and connection to nature, and how over time, reflecting on her identity and experiences led her to create Herb Gems to help reduce single plastic use in Taiwan. Hi, Tiffany, and welcome to Curio Connects. Hi, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> and really excited to reflect upon all of this together. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, so why don't we have you start off by telling us, take us back to your early days and the fond memories you have oh wow <laughs> as a Taiwanese girl growing up in Honduras back in the 90s yeah early 90s yep early um, 90s and how that experience kind of sh- shaped a lot of your I guess core memory and core foundation wow all right so yeah I was born in San Pedro Sula which is the capital city of Honduras and um well just thinking back well my parents they actually moved there even before I was born. My whole family actually moved there before I was born. And I kind of just popped out. Um, and I really vividly remember us having to move every one or two years because the crime rate was really, really bad after I was born. And so we had to really stay low. And by moving every one or two years, we could make sure that nobody was tracking us. Nobody knew, um, you know, like our whole schedule of like when we would get off school and then go back home and we couldn't go out maybe like around at around 7 p.m. Like we had to like, you know, close our doors and stay at home. So um, but then thinking about, you know, every house that we lived in, every house, we literally had like a little patch of like green grass or like every house had like a small pool. And back in Honduras in those days, there was no such thing as like a high rise. There was no such thing as like a living in an apartment in a big building. So every house was just like literally the most was like three stories tall. So um, it wasn't until I moved out of Honduras and then we moved to Vietnam and we started living in Ho Chi Minh City. We were like, I was like, wow, like there's so many tall buildings and There were so many apartments that had literally no grass. And that's when I realized I really took for granted stepping on grass every morning. Like this, this idea of like waking up in the morning and being able to go out in your backyard. Like there is no such thing in Vietnam anymore, Um, which is really interesting. And I also remember one of our like, well, one of my favorite houses back in Honduras, it had a really- One of your favorite houses. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, let me think maybe like the fourth house that we moved okay, in and I was like around 80 years old um, I remember yeah we had like a little hill at like behind the well there were four houses like connected and there it was like a small community and then behind those four houses there was a small hill and then in front of, in front of those four houses there was like a really long patch of green grass um and we had so many animals. We had like dogs, we had chickens, we had um, turtles, birds, like any kind of pet, you name it, we probably had back then. And that's where my love for animals like really started. Like I, I, really, I just remember playing with animals, worms, which was really normal to my sister and I. Um, the sister that, that's like my, my younger sister, older sister, um, she, she and I would like literally wake up. We we would go like back into like our backyard and start playing with worms. Like that that was normal. And once we moved to Vietnam, I also started talking to my other friends and be like, "Yeah, I used to play with worms." And then they'd be like, "What?" Like you know, because it was it was just so different. Yeah. So that that's where my love for nature and animals like that's where it started. 
<laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you really quickly if you could just share with us how your family back then in the '90s ended up packing up their bags in Taiwan and moving out there. Yeah. So my dad one day he wanted to start a business in Honduras and. He told my mom, "All right, so um, we're gonna move to Haiti first, and then from Haiti they went to Which is Haiti, right? Yeah, Haiti, okay. yeah. And then they were like, all right, so now that we can't live in Haiti anymore, we're just gonna pack our bags and go to Honduras.' So my mom hadn't traveled ever since since she was young, until she, they went to Haiti, and right after um, they moved to Honduras." my my mom was like in shock she, like you know she had just adjusted to haiti and they had two kids already and my dad literally was like yeah like haiti's getting too it's getting too dangerous like we got to get out of here um and there were a lot of like riots back then and yep so they literally moved their whole business and home to honduras and they had to restart all over again and a couple of years after that's where I popped where you out. Were, where yeah. You were born. <laughs> yep. So, so then, so you, okay, so you went from Honduras, and then you went to Vietnam, and then from Vietnam, then you came back to Taiwan to finish out your schooling before going to the U.S. Yeah. So as a as we coin these individuals, third cultural kid, which you clearly are, um, how <laughs> has that? How was the moving around? Um, was that were you able to adapt very easily in your in all these different environments? Um, how did that shape your understanding of yourself? And you said you're the youngest of three, so how was it like for your siblings and uh, your relationship with your parents in terms of understanding, like, what was going I'm so on? Confused. <laughs> I'm this Asian girl who speaks fluent Spanish <laughs> that, like, you know, and I don't speak Vietnamese. Yeah. And, um, I'm Taiwanese, but I don't feel Taiwanese when I'm in Taiwan. Right? Yeah, identity crisis. <laughs> identity crisis. <laughs> so I don't know if you've actually reflected um, about this in terms of when you look back and you trace back um, of, of the years that you kind of gone through, you know, and, and the different phases of yourself that you might remember, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was really strange. Like, I, I used to be bullied back in Honduras for being Asian. Like, they'd always be like, oh, the Chinese girl that's coming, you know, like, she's coming, uh, and then be, be like, ching chong chong, like, you know, like, that accent that they do. Um, so I think back then, it was really hard for me to identify myself as a Honduran. Like, I didn't look Honduran. Like, I clearly looked Asian. And even though I, like, I spoke the language, I spoke Spanish perfectly fine, um, I still couldn't call myself Honduran. And even when we would visit Taiwan back then, I remember not being able to speak to my grandparents at all because I couldn't speak Taiwanese. And I it was just really hard adapting back then. But it wasn't until we moved to Vietnam, that's when things got a little better because at school there were a lot of Asians, you know? Mm -hmm. There were Vietnamese, there were Koreans, there were so many Japanese too. So I could ident identify myself with them. Um, and so I think it was until then when I was like, okay, so I'm Asian. Like, I, I identify myself as Asian. And, you know, food-wise, like, it was really nice, too. Like, I, I liked Vietnamese food. Even though I loved Honduran food, I, you know, I, I really liked Asian food, too. Um, but it was, it was just, like, interesting to see the transition from having to identify myself as Honduran and then identifying myself as Asian. But then I also had an identity crisis when I was in high school in Taiwan because... I couldn't even take Chinese as um, as a second language. as a second language because I couldn't catch up. Like the teacher even told me, I think it's best if you take Spanish or French because you're gonna fail Chinese probably. And I was like, okay. So I took um, Spanish. I, I took Spanish and then I took Chinese um, outside of school just so I could like catch up a little. And that's how I learned how to like kind of like listen better i like have a better listening and understanding now but um like reading and writing like i still couldn't read and write at all it's okay i still cannot write <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard you're not alone <laughs> thank god <laughs> thank goodness but um yeah it's just so hard 
and like even reading the menu you know like going to a restaurant and like not knowing what to order like I remember my sister and I we had such a tough time we ordered four soups at a restaurant one time because yeah it was just it was yeah it was so like that whole it's funny but at the time it was not it was not funny (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah so yeah like those transitions are, are very interesting and until now I'm like all right so I still I still know that I'm not a fully Taiwanese and I'm not a fully Honduran but I just I can identify myself as Asian in general I think mm. yeah so so when you I mean when we speak about identity how do you how do you when you socialize in social settings how do you present yourself <laughs> hi I'm Tiffany and they go cool like where are you from literally hi I'm Taiwanese um but I was born in Honduras mm. and that's it because <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, it's, it's really hard for me to say, um, hi, I'm Honduran and I'm, my parents are Taiwanese. Like, I think the other way around, it, it kind of like, it's a little, it's a little harder to explain. Yeah. So I think the whole like, hi, I'm Taiwanese, but I was born in Honduras. And then I start telling my story in Honduras. Yeah. It's very, it's very interesting, isn't it? Like how you choose to identify yourself. Yeah. With, with, right. It's like. Definitely. Yeah. Is it by the country you were born and raised in? Yeah. Is it by your ethnicity, where, yeah. where, where your parents are from? Yeah. Um, so when you went off to college in the U.S., which is then, you know, your fourth country, um, what was that experience like? You went to Parsons in New York, right? So how was that another culture shock of sorts? or? Um, you know, it's also really interesting because, like, I started speaking... I, whenever I'd speak in English, people would be like, "Oh, like were you were you in the U.S. before college?" But then I'd be like, "No, like I, I was born in Honduras, and like that's how it would start." And um, there were in at Parsons, there were a lot of Taiwanese kids too, actually. And it was really nice to be able to like talk to them and like have like you know like our our group, like it was like a Taiwanese association where. Um, we all had like different stories. I like I really clicked with that group, um, trying to like go back to my own roots. But then I also really clicked with like you know like the U like Americans or like you know people coming from Europe or Spain. There were a lot of Spanish people too, so it was also really interesting to be able to like click with them um, and then tell them like you know like my stories back in Honduras and a lot of people who were like from Colombia or Venezuela. They'd be like, oh, I totally understand. Like. Venezuela is really, really dangerous too. And I'd be like, oh yeah, I completely get you. Like they came and go back home. And that's something I can relate to as well. Cause I've never been back in Honduras ever since we left mm-hmm. when I was 10 years old. I love to visit home, but I think it's, I think at this point it's so hard. Yeah. When the military took over the government, that's when Honduras just, yeah, it, you can't step back in as an Asian it's really really hard yeah and so just out of curiosity and then we'll pivot slowly into into uh, further other uh, topics but yeah. I wanted to ask so at the time um, h- how did you navigate this kind of like identity and culture element you know of yourself um, did your parents were they quite involved in making sure you understood like your Taiwanese and you know made you speak Chinese at home um you know or were they just very very busy hustling because I mean they gave up a lot to do what they were doing at the time as well to move you guys around and reset themselves up each time I mean I think for that generation it's very amazing (laughs) yeah (laughs) tell us to the parents who've done that oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) so I'm just curious like if they were like, you know, if they were involved or if they were, yeah, or if you just knew, like, it's like, okay, well, I just have to figure it out because mom and dad are just very busy, you know, trying to, trying to make sure that we, you know, we're yeah. okay. Um, my parents never attended any parenting meeting at school. Like, like all my teachers would even ask me, like, are you sure your parents are not going to come this time? I'd be like, nope, they're not coming. Like, basketball, um, tournaments, they never show up. They couldn't. Like, I, and I don't blame them. Like, I completely understand now. But back then, um, as a kid who was growing up, you know, and was being bullied even at school sometimes, they, they couldn't be there. And it was my sister. Thankfully, we're, like, seven years apart. And my oldest sister, who's 14 years apart, 
um, like our age gap is 14 years apart, they were able to take care of me. And so I think it was my second sister who I really need to thank. She was literally like my little mom who would always like make sure I'd be okay. When I was bullied, she'd be the one who'd like, you know, go talk to like the other kids and be like, hey, like, what's up, you know? Um, so I think she really helped me in shaping of who I am, like identity wise. I'd also talk to her about like, hey, like, do you ever feel this way? Like, um, are, are you being bullied at school? Like, how? Because I feel like her year was much nicer than my year at school. But um, she really clicked with like the, all of the mm. Honduran people because they weren't going through, they weren't going through puberty, puberty like puberty. I was. <laughs> yeah, so um, they were much more mature. So yeah, I think she really helped me in find, figuring out who I was and like, you know, because she was going through the same boat. She was also having a dent to the crisis. Like she, she tried dyeing her hair blonde, trying to fit in as well at some point. So little things like that, like, she really helped me out wow. big time. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. That'd be a fun conversation to have. So <laughs> then, okay, so then now we're at uh, college, post-college. And um, earlier before we were recording, you had mentioned that you chose to study photography and um, communication, communication design. design. Yeah. So what did you do after you graduated? After I graduated, um, I was a photo assistant for a, a year and a half. And then after that, I was working at Milk as, um, as a photo editor. Well, literally like editing photos. And um, that's when I realized like I really loved photo, but then I wanted to do something more than that. Like I started getting into like packaging design as well. Like I really liked web design. And that's something that has really helped me now, um, especially for like herb gents, like, like, you know, like the whole website or all of the packaging, like I've been doing the creative design and then my sister has been doing more like the business design, all the accounting, cause I'm not good with numbers. I, I'm really not good with math. Um, so I think hand in hand like that, that's a really good balance between it. It's like, I get to do like the whole creative side, which I really learned back at Parsons um, and I also learned a lot of like photography styles that I'm not now doing for herb gents as well. Um, so I think being a photo editor or also a photographer um, back in New York, it was great, but I just needed a little bit. I like I was trying to figure out like even like my photographs, like I did a lot of still lives and I'm still continuing doing that with herb gents, which I love. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's nice to, to, I think I found like a bigger purpose of like where I can connect my design and my love for nature mm -hmm. and combine everything together. Yeah. Okay. So then I'm going to, I'm going to find a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how did you then decide? So you said you were working at different places as a photo editor and assistant, um, in New York. How did you end your older sister and your second sister how did you guys end up leaving the u.s oh. to come back to asia to start herb gens like was did you watch a documentary that really inspired you did <laughs> something actually physically happen that made you think gosh like you yeah know, the, the you know no plastic waste yeah um uh, you know, when was that? Maybe three, four years ago when yeah. there was a big push about no plastic waste and, yeah. and it still is today. But what was it that triggered you to think, you know, I, I, I'm so passionate about this topic. I want to, I want to tackle it. Cause it didn't sound like you studied it in school. Yep. Not at um, all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? I think at the back of my head, like, especially cause of Honduras, there was this thing where every weekend my family and I we would go to the beach. If it wasn't if it wasn't the beach, it'd be hiking. So um, I think ever since going to the beach, especially in Honduras, like all the beaches there are so blue. Like literally, when you look down, you can see from the top like all the fish, all the turtles down there because the water is just so clear. And if you go to like the sand area, there's not one single like trash and like that's just something that really clicked with me and then when i went to vietnam when i was there for middle school and then we'd go to the beach you know there'd be like a couple 
you know, like there'd be like a little bit of garbage here and there, but not as much as now. Like now thinking back, Roatan, like the beach in, in Honduras, I'm like, what happened to our beaches? Like I, I've been going to like beach cleanups recently too in Taiwan. And I'm like, wow, like, I, like you're just standing there and there's just like waves of like trash just like coming in. And that's when I'm like, okay, I need to do something. Like, I love nature. I love animals. Like, I, I need to do something. And so I started thinking, okay, what's what's a type of plastic item in Taiwan that's, like, really, really being used, like, overused, maybe? And that was just, that's when it came to me, like, plastic straws. Like, there's so much, like, there's so many, like, boba drink places in Taiwan. There's a lot of... um you know, like tea places, coffee places, and a lot of them do really use plastic straws. And I was like, okay, so I started researching a lot. Um, how can I replace this? And that's when I came across uh, grass straws, which were being made in Vietnam. And so that's when I was like, okay, it, everything clicked. I was like, I started contacting all of the factories that were making grass straws in Vietnam and a lot of them got back to me and I started um you know going through like more details and so then I found this really great one and I started importing them and ever since I'm like all right so this is this is my true passion like this is what I want to do like you found your path yes I found my path <laughs> and I can start in Taiwan you know like I I'm like super happy here like I really want to spread awareness I want to like see where this can go, um, and so. So as a as an entrepreneur, how did you uh, fund this? Did you do like a crowdfunding? Like, did you? And you and if I remember correctly, you started this during COVID. Yeah. <laughs> so you had at this point left the U.S. Um, and you packed up, and then you yeah came back to Taiwan as a adult again, moving back. Yeah and not fluent in Mandarin. Yeah. So lots of rules and regulations. It's almost like you were a foreigner coming yeah, in here and, and starting much. a business. Uh, you didn't do huge market research to understand who else was using eco-friendly straws in, in, in the marketplace, but just thinking in your head, like, there is waste. Yeah. Um, plastic straws is a big category. Yeah. How can we combat this? What are the solutions? And you did the research and you put it together with your sister. Yeah. And how did you, yeah, how did you guys and initially figure that out? Like and did you have like a network of individuals that you were already, you know, seeking that you were like, "Okay, this is the plan. Like this is how we're going to execute this." And, you know? Yep. Uh <laughs> all, admit, all admits the chaos in the world that was happening during COVID where shipping companies and logistics and all that was on major halt. Oh yeah, yeah. Big time. Uh so yeah. Funny side story, because we had saved up some money from the sales that we had made from so I was selling medical scrubs back then. I Right after the U.S., after leaving New York, we, I, we, well, my sister going from Taiwan, we moved to Hong Kong, and that's when we started our medical scrubs business. business, and we had made some money over there, which we had saved up, and which made sense because that was during COVID. Yeah, during COVID <laughs> medical times. Medical scrubs were in need. <laughs> oh yeah, and so. When we moved to Taiwan, we realized that medical scrubs wasn't something that we truly wanted to continue, and we um, so we were like, okay, so after selling all the medical scrubs fully, even like after the first batch, we were not going to continue making medical scrubs, and so that's where that's how we invested all of that money into Urgence. Urgence, which is now, and my sister and I, we have been. Um, going to like, you know, like little markets selling here and there. And that's where we've been making a little bit more money too. But, um, it was really hard because a lot of our costs really literally went into like shipping costs. Like you said, you know, like a lot of things got delayed. They were stuck at immigration. So a lot, a lot of money just went into that. And, 
um, up until now, we're like trying to like think of ways of like how to like spread more awareness, how to like you know get to like coffee shops or more like drinking stores, um, and how to like make people care about like single plastic use. I think it's great that in Taiwan, a lot of stores are starting to like you know like try to try to stop using plastic as well. Um, but I don't think they've found a replacement yet, because there's a lot of like paper straws that you see, but For them, maybe that's the solution now, but it's not like it's they they still they still get soggy, you know. Um, so that's something that we're trying to like also like introduce like okay like grass straws don't get soggy and then they can also be um, sold at like you know like a low cost like because I think that's the biggest problem right now. Like everyone thinks that going from a cost of like plastic to a replacement for plastic. You know, single plastic use. That's a really hard transition. Like for stores, like that's a huge commitment cost-wise. Like going from like you know like plastic, which is like a few cents, and then going to like another straw. Nowadays, like paper, sure it can maybe be around the same cost, but um, that's what that's why grass straws. Like I'm trying to like. There's no you don't need to make a mold for grass straws like the way that grass is born like the way that it's um that it's that it's being um born that's how you literally just have to cut it like there's no mold to it there's no mold cost you're not you're, you're it's literally grass that's what it is you just think wow our ancestors and mother nature are so clever isn't it oh and yeah it's just 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 like that you didn't even have to put any effort yeah anyway. um well. That it sounds like you had a huge learning curve in the last few years of um, diving deep into this subject matter and this industry. Absolutely. <laughs> um, when you look back now, and I mean, you know, obviously you're still on this journey, but when you look back now, do you? What would be some of the bigger challenges that you think you face? I mean, it doesn't have to be this question. You know, I'm asking. It doesn't have to be on urgence. It could also be like you mentioned earlier. You know, having to pick up and move every few years, uh, readjusting to um, the schools. You know, and almost feeling like you kind of raised yourself, but also you, thankfully you had your older sister to kind of guide you as yeah. she was going through it as well. Um, when you think back to were there. There, were there moments in time where you just thought, "Wow, this is so hard. I don't, I don't know if I could get out of this." And, and you know, what helped you overcome that experience? Uh, well, I think now, I just got married, so I feel like that's a really different phase that I'm going to be going through more and more. And then, you know, thinking about marriage now, um, that's going to be like a really different phase for me as well. But uh, don't worry, we can come back and do another recording in like 20 years <laughs> <laughs> with all the other guests. <laughs> so it's just, I think now thinking about it, it's it's gonna be something that I can't I can't even ask my other sister because she's not married yet either. But my oldest sister is, so thankfully I can get advice from her. But um, I think it's just gonna be really interesting, even like. Just the idea of like having kids in Taiwan, and the idea of them not being able to have a backyard like we did, you know, like that's something that I think we took for granted. My sisters and I, being born in a place where if you step outside, you, you know, you have animals, you have a zoo outside of your house, and being able to like you know go to the beach, which is like 20 minute right, or going to the mountain and hike for like, which is also like a 20 minute right. So I think just the idea of that, thinking about our kids not being able to do that in Taiwan, I think it's going to be a little bit hard to adjust because I've been through it already and I know what it's like to be, to be in a place where you know you have grass right outside. Um, but then something that, something other than than identity, um, I think. Self acceptance. That's gonna be a huge topic, but just like talking about it, like you know, like just roughly touching upon it. Um, self acceptance. That that was something I had to go through a lot as well, because you know, being bullied as well, and like being called Chinese. Like 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 those were really big moments in my life where 
I couldn't, I, I looked at myself in the mirror and I just couldn't understand who I was. Like, I just, I, 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 I would see an Asian, but then culturally inside, like I was just not Asian and I just couldn't, I didn't know how to, how to like speak to my parents about it either. Cause they were just never there during our childhood. So they didn't really understand what we were going, what I was going through. Um, so it's just, yeah, I think up until now, finally, during these three years, maybe, like, I finally can say that I've, I've accepted myself more and more. Like, I can, and thankfully to my husband, too, r- big thank you to him. Like, more and more I can, like, identify as someone that I am happy with myself. And, like, I don't have to be, like, Taiwanese or Honduras. Mm-hmm. I don't have to call myself names to be something. Like, I'm just, I am Tiffany. I am now living in Taiwan. I used to live, I was born in Honduras. I used to live in Vietnam, but I'm here now. Um, and that's who I am. So I think that was just something that I had to go through myself. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm self-accepted kind of, mostly now. Oh, well, yeah. that's a huge step. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Well, but it also sounds like at the same time, your relationship with your husband, um, finding herb gems, all of that really gave you more purpose and clarity in the direction yeah. of what you wanted to do and what was so passionate and in, in alignment with who you are. So within all that wrapped up together, it helped you kind of find Ooh. your, your self-acceptance of who you are, yeah. as you are, regardless yeah. of all the different labels that came before you, because that's... It is still also who you are, yeah. um, but but you can be more accepting of of the, the you now, yeah, so to speak. Um, Definitely, yeah. And I think also, you know what, going back to my roots and like you know like talking to my family and like going to my uncles and aunts because I wasn't close to them back in Honduras. Like we would barely visit Taiwan back then. So just like reconnecting with them, like that really has helped me too. Like. Now I'm like, I, my Chinese is better, so I can like actually talk to them. And um, my grandparents too, like I, I can, my Taiwanese has also gotten better, so I can, you know, communicate, communicate with, them. with them much better now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just thought it was really interesting because he kept bringing up the, the notion of the fact that taking for granted having nature just right outside your doorstep. Um, and I was, I was just thinking uh, when you when you brought this up in the conversation so far I was wondering when you were at times uh, missing that you know like let's say in the different cities you lived in whether it was in New York or in Hong Kong or you know um, in Vietnam did you try to seek that out yourself you know what I mean like you it sounded like there was a craving for you to be in nature because you didn't have that anymore like you were surrounded by like a concrete jungle, you know, yeah. in big cities. So how, for you, did you find that balance to explore? Because a lot of these places you mentioned, including Taiwan, yeah. <laughs> for those who don't know Taiwan, yeah. we actually, we're an island and we have amazing nature. Yeah. Um, so I, I was just curious how you uh, found that balance for yourself. Um, and was just going to throw in a little challenge and be like, well, you don't have to raise your kids in Taipei. Yeah, true. There's a lot of places on, in the, on the <laughs> island that has, has nature up right outside your doorstep. So, so I was just going to ask yeah, that question of how did you find nature where you felt like you couldn't find it just walking outside of your door? Yeah, especially New York. Um, it was so strange. You know, I was, I was, I was also living in, in like in a tall building and back in, well, I was living in Chinatown, actually, my last year, I was in Chinatown, and it was, it was really funny, because it wasn't until then, when I really, I, I had to come back to Taiwan more often, just because I, I don't, I don't think I could, I couldn't stand New York anymore, like, I was, I was almost, like, suffocating, I felt, like, during my fifth year in New York, that's when I realized I need to get out of New York, and that's when I started coming to Taiwan longer because I was working already and I started coming to Taiwan longer and I kept telling myself like I I just had to get out of there like even like 
during small trips, like I would always go to like you know nature. I would go upstate. Um, I would go to California and visit my sister when she was living back there. She was living in California, so we'd always take like small trips to nature. Um, but I couldn't just stay in New York anymore. Like I, I, I didn't see myself living there long term anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started having all these thoughts. And that's when my sister and I were like, maybe we can move to Hong Kong. Another <laughs> island? <laughs> no, I don't know. Great. A little Hong bit. Kong does have nature too. Yeah. It's true. There is mountains. Yeah. Lots of great trails. Yeah. The ocean surrounds the body of the water as well. So. Exactly. And that's why we also chose Tong Chong um, in Hong Kong because it's closer to like, you know, other mountains and stuff. And my ex, who also moved to Hong Kong, Hong Kong back then, we would always like take a weekend trip probably like into nature like we had to. And now in Taiwan, I feel like there's a lot of nature that's closer. And now, like even my husband uh, and myself, like we take camping trips. We go to like, you know, um, whenever we go to Taizong or we go to Taitong, we definitely go camping for like one or two days. Um, so I think that's really that that definitely has taken that that's taken myself to like back to my childhood memories where like, you know, like I'm like super connected to nature and I have to be out there. Um, yeah. Even our kids, though, like we're thinking maybe it doesn't have to be Taipei. You're exactly. right. Yeah, if there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, we can go to, <laughs> we can go to Taitong for sure. <laughs> okay, so um, I would, I mean, we can keep going because I could also just have you kind of educate us a little bit more about the difference between plastic straws compared to reed or grass straws, but I will let um, the viewers kind of go on your website and follow your Instagram to learn more about that. So I would like to wrap our conversation up by, um, I usually ask my guests these three questions. So the first one is, um, what keeps you grounded? And I think I could probably answer that for you. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, what, is there anything else that you you do when you're, you know, feeling down or confused or, you know, like, is there, do you have yeah. a certain practice in your life that you do or is it really just like, I just need to just walk to the, the closest park, even <laughs> if it's a man-made park yeah. down the street, you know? Uh, what keeps me grounded? That's a really good question, yeah. Uh, recently, I've been reading a lot of books. And there's the one that I've been reading nowadays, um, it's called Lighter by Young Pueblo. And I really recommend it to everyone. Like, I think it's a great book. It really talks a lot about self-healing. It talks about the, the great connection between self-healing and self-love and um, how everyone should, you know, like really dig deep and like go into your roots. He's a great writer. I think while you're reading, you're really reflecting a lot which I think it's great. Like, I think I, I, I'm like halfway through right now and I'm like, wow, like I've been self-reflecting so much. And he, like after every chapter, he has a couple of questions that he also asks you. So I'm like always answering questions, like, you know, in my head, I'm like, all right, um, so this is this and this is that and this is why I feel like this. And so I feel like reading these books, like they, they've really been granted me a lot, a lot especially because my husband also loves reading he, he loves reading um Osho books and for those who don't know that he talks a lot about like you know Lao Tzu and like um Tao like what's the meaning of Tao like you know like Tao is like in everyone's life and like everyone's trying to figure this thing in life so I also recommend everyone to read Osho I think he's great um so I think these books yeah definitely they definitely keep me grounded as well, other than nature. Well, you just answered the second question. Oh. <laughs> as well, oh. With, your, with your first question. Um, yeah, because my second question usually is, what books or podcasts or mentors have helped you along the way? And, yeah. And obviously you, you mentioned Young Pueblo's books and Osho's books. And then the last question um, that I normally ask is, what... So, you can take this in, you know, however you want to answer it, but it's, you know, the question is usually like, what would you tell your younger self what you know now? Or kind of like, what two cent would you tell others who are listening to your episode and like resonate with your storyline, whether it's the 
you know, TCK part, the third cultural kid part, identity, self-acceptance, or the entrepreneurial journey part of just like diving in and being super passionate about combating, combating plastic waste. Um, yeah, so kind of like what advice would you give mm. either like to your younger self or to those who are listening to your episode? Um, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say identity. I think that's something that I struggled with when I was, you know, a child. So now looking back, if I were to tell myself, um, if I were to talk about identity, I'd be like, you know, everyone, like even I'm sure most of us, like if we don't have identity crisis, like a lot of us think, think about, you know, like our flaws here and there. And I think self-acceptance, like that's such a huge topic. I think, um, for me, like it, it, it was such a turning point where I, I like, I had to look at myself in the mirror, like even during these three years and be like, okay, like, you know, like you're, you're Asian, like, you know, like, um, you look Asian, but you don't, you don't have to represent yourself. You don't have to identify yourself as Asian. So, um, young Tiff, uh, you don't, you don't have to be Honduran. You don't have to be Asian. You don't have to be called any, like, you know, any type of like, um, uh, you don't have to be like any of that you don't have to be Taiwanese nor Honduran, but all you have to do is um, be happy with who you, who you are. You know, like if the more you know yourself, the more you don't have to put these labels upon yourself. Like you don't have to call yourself um, this and that in order to to be that. So yeah, it's fine. Like whenever you introduce yourself, you can just be like, "Hi, I'm Tiffany." And until people ask you where are you from, and I'm also maybe I have to get into like that habit of like hey I'm Tiffany until so people ask me where are you from oh yeah okay so then that's when I start I'm Taiwanese blah 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 but I think yeah I think it's it's we're, we're all just so tied in into like the first few questions that we ask each other are like where are you from like and what do you do and like all of these questions you know so young Tiff it's fine like y- you don't have to be anything you're just Tiff like that that's it yeah mm. yeah it's very true <laughs> But it, it takes it takes time to figure a that lot, out. A lot, yeah. A lot of reflecting, a lot of putting yourself out there, a lot of trial and error. Yeah. Um, but Definitely. congratulations <laughs> for getting to that stage. <laughs> um, and so I will put all the resources that we've talked about um, on the episode resources link below. So including your website, social media, um, the books you recommended. Um, was there anything else you wanted to share before we wrap up? Um, I think you, you answered everything and asked everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, th- thank you. Thank no, you so thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you for, for making a difference in the townies, uh, you know, fight for no plastic <laughs> waste. We have a long way to go. Oh, yeah. Um, but, but, you We're know. We're getting there. We're getting there. Slowly but surely. One straw at a time. Yeah, one straw at a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. That's all we have time for today. Thank you for listening to Curito Connects. For more Connects content, collaborations, and discoveries set to inspire you on your own individual journey, please head to our website at www.curito.co. Until next time, stay inspired and thank you for joining us at Curito Connects.